But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 6, 33, dear fellow redeemed. A statement that I want you to really hold on to this morning, through worship, after worship, quite honestly, the rest of your days is this. God is always doing more than you know. God is doing more than you can see, more than you can perceive and all honesty, God is doing more than you can even dare or hope to dream. In all events of your life, think your personal life, think the life of your family, think the life of this congregation, the life of this city, the life of this state, this nation, this world, this universe. God is doing more than what you can see. For every one thing that you can see that God is doing, he's doing thousands of things you don't even see. And you know he's doing them, and you know they're good, you know they're wonderful, you know they're right. You know that God is in complete control, that he works everything for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So Jesus is in control. That means, most obviously, I'm not in control. I get it. There's a lot of things in life I can't even hope to dream to be in control of. But that means I'm not even in control of my own life. That means that no one else is in control. That means that random forces of change or luck or whatever you want to call it, fates, norms, are not in control. God is in control. Now when we break this down to a very personal level, when it comes down to just us and our own lives and and our loved ones, that's hard to admit. Because we like control. We like thinking, and that's probably the reality. We like the illusion that we have so much control over things in our lives, even in a small way. I'm here to tell you, you don't. God is in control. To be certain, he gives you a certain amount of freedom to use and to to exercise. But as he informed Job, and as he informs us so clearly and so often in the pages of Scripture, God is in control And we like it that way. We rejoice in that. So this morning, we're going to look at two texts that flow together in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to look at them from two different positions. The first position, we're going to use and talk about faith. Last week, we discussed faith. We discussed that faith isn't simply acknowledging Jesus. Faith is not saying, yeah, I know Jesus is real, and I know he's God. The demons know that. Faith is putting our trust, our dependency, putting the weight of our future, our lives, the lives of our loved ones, it's putting that weight on Jesus and resting it there. It's having this complete dependency on Jesus for life, for salvation, for everything. Because Jesus is the one in control. He's the one who loves us. An illustration of this could could go like this. When, when an individual or two individuals, a man and a woman, enter into the covenantal relationship of marriage, they're saying yes to their spouse and they're saying no to everybody else out there. Now, when the Holy Spirit, and understand, it's the Holy Spirit who brings you to faith. When the Holy Spirit brings you to faith and creates faith in your heart, you are saying yes to God and no to anyone or anything else that would be a God in your life that would take a higher priority or position. You're saying, Jesus, you're supreme. You rule my life. Every aspect of my life, the allegiance of my heart is given to you first and foremost and everything else flows under that. You're saying then that I find my greatest joy, my greatest satisfaction, my greatest contentment, I am complete in you, Jesus, and nothing else. And so other joys that you bring me, other satisfactions that I feel, I only feel and have because they're coming from you. They're not in competition with you, Jesus. They're blessings from you. Okay, that's the first front. And we're going to look at that with the first part of the text. And then the second front is this point we've been making. God is in control. God is in control, and he can't be controlled by me. He can't be controlled by you or by anybody. God is always going to determine what God wants to do, and God is going to do it. And when he does it, it's going to be right, it's going to be good, it's going to be wise, it's going to be beneficial, it's going to be beautiful, and you're going to rejoice in it. 
no matter what it means for you right now in the current present. That means that God acts without consulting me first. Now, we want to understand, again, this doesn't mean don't ever pray. I mean, don't take it to that ridiculous thought line. God wants us to pray. God tells us, pray genuinely, sincerely. Pour out your heart to me. Talk to me. I'm God. I'm your father. I love you, he says. But our prayers don't control God. Our prayers don't make deals with God. We don't do things or behave in a certain way or offer some kind of sacrifice and then God will submit to our will because we did this, this, and this. It doesn't work like that. God is so clear it doesn't work like that. God is uncontrollable to us. And again, that's something that I want you to rejoice in. I want you to find complete comfort in that we have no ability and no man can control God. That's one of the greatest struggles in life, isn't it? We struggle with this in prayer. We ask God, help me learn and grow in the reality that I can't control you. But rather that God, you are powerful, you are loving, you are good. Control me. Lead me more and more to surrender my will and my heart to you. I want to walk in obedience to you. Where you lead God, take me. Even if I'm fighting and kicking the whole way, I don't want to fight and kick, but take me there. Because, God, I know when you're in control, and you are, all things are good. This is why Jesus teaches us so well there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will be done. God is uncontrollable, and we're happy about it. So this morning, we examine both aspects of this in the sermon. We look at how Jesus is absolute in our life, and this is great. When Jesus ceases to be absolute in our life, we become, in essence, our own gods. We serve ourselves, and we are terrible gods. It's when we make a mess of things, our life and those around us. But when we find, by his grace, full satisfaction and complete joy in Christ the Savior, oh, that's sweet. And then we look at the fact that he is in control. With that in mind, then, I invite you to a familiar section of the Bible Very powerful, Matthew 8, 18 through 27. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You have little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So far, the very words of our God. May the Holy Spirit give us each wise and receptive heart so that we accept these words as from God alone and that we would utilize them and treasure them as the Lord would have us. With that in mind, we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. So like I said in the opening... For every one thing that we can see God doing, he's doing thousands of things. Thousands. So here we have these encounters. And in both of these encounters with the two would-be followers and then the disciples, the, the current followers of his, if you will, they're in the boat. What Jesus is doing is he's teaching them and he's testing them. He's teaching us and he's testing us. Jesus is so clear. He is so clear. To be a follower of his is going to be a difficult thing in this world. In fact, we're being showed, are you ready to follow Jesus? It's going to be costly. It's going to cost you. The flesh is going to fight you. The world is going to fight you. They don't want you to follow Jesus. And so it may hurt. It may hurt big time in this life. But it's worth it. It's so worth it, as the Lord shows us. The Lord also shows us that he addresses 
all the details in our lives that we need addressed, and he sees to all of our problems and handles them. So what we see here is, is Christ sets the terms. In the first account now, in the first half here, um, 18 through 22, Jesus, you don't come to him and make a deal. Oh, Jesus, I'll follow you, but you know, I want this, I want that. I want these kind of assurances. If I'm with you, will my kids be okay? Will my earthly future be secure? And Jesus is saying, no. No, it might cost you everything. What he shows us here uh, in number one is that he makes the deal, not us. He's saying, and he says this in other places, I need to be absolute in your life. You don't half follow me. You don't 75% or 95% be mine. You're either with me or you are against me. He said it this way in Luke, Luke eleven twenty three. 23. Jesus says, you're either with me or you're against me. You either come and gather with me or you're coming in and you're scattering everything away from me. That's it. You're on one side or the other. There's no in-between, no middle ground. So what's happening is Jesus is showing us his authority. First guy comes to him, and, and perhaps this person is just one of these enthusiasts. They're just a zealot. They're so excited. Big statement here. He says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. You name it, I'm there with you, Jesus. But here's the beauty of Jesus. He knows what we need to hear when we need to hear it. He cuts away and speaks right to the heart. And so Jesus says to this man something he needs to hear. This man hasn't even begun to count the cost of what it'll mean to be a follower of Jesus. So Jesus says to him, in essence, you want to follow me, okay, but you, are, you have no guarantee of a roof even over your head. There's no guarantee you're going to have a place to sleep or a place to stay. You see, when you follow me, I am all that you get. I am what you are guaranteed. I am what's promised to you. We meet the second potential follower. He comes back, and this is an interesting one. He says to the Lord, Lord, uh, before I follow you, let me go back and, and bury my father. Now, there is some debate whether or not the father was dying or just died and the man wanted to quick, you know, gather up his inheritance and then follow Jesus, or whether he nobly wanted to see to the burial of his father. And culturally speaking, this is hugely significant. This is a patriarch society, so dad is big. You don't miss your father's funeral. So Jesus says to him, again, knowing what the man needs to hear, Jesus says to him, let the dead go bury the dead. Seems hugely offensive, but Jesus is making a big point. Jesus is saying, to follow me is to leave everything behind, including family allegiances or loyalty. I'm first. I must be first. I must be absolute, or you're no follower of mine. Only undivided, or undivided attention and affection. So Jesus' responses can be this. Following him means you are not guaranteed earthly physical, material promises. You don't have those. Jesus doesn't say, hey, give me your first thousand and I'll bring you back ten thousand. Actually, Jesus says, follow me and you might have absolutely nothing. You might have everything. It's all under me if I want you to have it or not. Jesus is also saying that no person, no family, no other loyalty could be above him. If it is, we're not worthy of him, he tells us. So what's he doing? He's teaching and he's testing. The path that a person will walk with Jesus through faith is a path that's going to be hard. It's going to require sacrifices. You're going to get uncomfortable in a sinful world that doesn't want you with Jesus. Even your own flesh doesn't want you with Jesus. It's not going to be easy. Only he can give you the strength to do it. Only he can give you the strength to see that he really is the greatest treasure in your life and the greatest treasure that there possibly is so when it comes to jesus when we come to jesus when we say jesus i'll follow you jesus is saying right here so clearly how much do you really love me how much do you really love me will you sacrifice that entertainment or pleasure that goes against what i have to say to you will you come out of a comfort zone for me Will you end friendships that lead you away from me and not closer to me? Will you walk away from your career 
Will you give up your image in the eyes of others? Would you give up your health and your goals to have me? Am I that much to you? Now, I want you to know something here as we talk about this. And the Bible's clear about this, too. Jesus is the creator of the universe. He's the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. He holds the universe together by the power of his words. He was perfect in life. He defeated death. He defeated sin. Demons in hell quake at the very mention of his name. Jesus is the powerful God that calls you through the gospel and draws you to himself. He calls you by name. He lived for you as a substitute, taking his perfection and giving it to you, meanwhile taking the result of your sins on the cross. All of this Jesus does for us. Is Jesus worth it? Is he worth it? He also promises us this. You have no physical guarantees. You have no earthly promise, but he says to you this, I'm with you. You have the promise of me always being with you. So here's the deep question then that we have to really consider prayerfully this morning. We've got to take this one to heart. We have to really ask ourselves, is Jesus enough? Is he enough? Could God come into my life, which he's here, and take all these wonderful things that I appreciate and thank and strip them away from me and still be enough for me? Or is God only enough for me when I'm being blessed with health and finances and strong relationships? Is he enough? Is he my joy? Is he my treasure? Is he my security? Is he my friend? Is he my hope? Is God my home? That's what he's asking. Now, don't be offended by this. Jesus is asking if he's your goal. He's not telling you to do something for him. No, no. Jesus isn't calling attention to you and what he's going to do for you. And don't get lost in overreactions. Jesus is not saying you can't own a house or you can't have a place to lay your head and sleep. Jesus isn't saying skip your parents' funeral. Jesus isn't creating new laws that his followers have to follow. The point here is Jesus knows our idols. He knows our weaknesses. Jesus knows what it is that's out there that competes for our affection, that competes for our hearts. Jesus is looking us in the face and saying, will you release that for me? Am I greater than that? Will you surrender whatever it is to be with me? How do you answer that? Does your life show that Christ is the treasure of your heart, that all these great blessings flow through him and under him? Let's move to the second aspect of the text. Now we see Jesus then gets into the boat with the disciples and he shows them he cannot be controlled. In fact, he shows them that even the awesome power of nature must serve him. He's in the boat with his disciples. He's tired. Remember, he's fully human. He's full God. He's full human. He's tired. He's sleeping in the boat. He's on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is one of these very interesting geographical places. They've got mountains or hills to the west, and then the Mediterranean is over there, so there's cooler air. And then over to the... East is the desert where the hot air, it's many hundreds of feet below sea level. So what would happen is the hot air would come in, the cold air would come in, and bam, storm. Instant storm, known for that. It's about 13 miles long and 8 miles wide, and the disciples were somewhere in the middle of it, and a storm just, boom, comes up on them. Now, what's kind of interesting to think about is we live in the city, and the thing about cities, especially huge cities, is it's all about humans in the cities. We got buildings, we drive cars, we try to tame nature so it's not inconvenient to us. But every so often the Lord sends a storm through when we realize we can't contain nature. In fact, if you want to know how puny we really are, here's my advice. Get a boat, sail out in a large body of water, ocean, lake, sea, whatever, look around, and then I hope a storm doesn't come up because that would be really scary. But you see how weak we really, really are. In ancient cultures, they saw the ocean and the sea, and they marveled at its untamed power. So you know what they did. We've talked about it before. They would invent a god, and they would serve the god, and then the god would control nature for them. Did that work? You know the answer. Absolutely not. Here, Jesus is showing the disciples he controls nature. There's no end to his power. So the storm hits, 
And now, a little divergent here, most sermons that you'll probably ever hear on this text in Matthew, and, and this is a fine way to approach it, they say the storm hits, Jesus calms the storm, which he does. Then they say, storms come into your life, which they do. Jesus controls and often calms those storms, which he does. Then the question is asked, are you facing a storm right now? Maybe you went through one in your life. Maybe one is coming. Maybe right now you're in a storm. It could be relational. It could be some kind of health thing. It could be finances. It could be career. Whatever it is, and I'm not making light of it, whatever it is, most sermons on this will talk about how Jesus can calm it. And that's true. He often calms it. But sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he doesn't. And that brings us to the real point of this text. The real point of this text isn't every time a storm comes into your life, God will, boom, clear and calm. That's not the real point of the text. The text goes deeper, way deeper. In fact, if you look at verse 27, you get a clear idea of what the Lord is telling you. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. The point of the text is pointing to Jesus. The disciples are saying, we're with the very Son of God. They were moved. Remember how at the opening of the service I talked about how culturally speaking throughout the book of Psalms, people would talk about the difficulties in their lives and they'd say, God comes and God delivers and they'd use the metaphors of waters rising over them. Here's one example The psalmist says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out from calling to you for help. My throat is parched. My eyes look to you, God. Or Psalm 107, 29, the psalmist says, God made the storm to be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. What the major point is, of this text is, is the disciples see that this is the promised Son of God right in their midst. They're seeing him. He stills the storm. They're coming. They're realizing who it is. This account points to Jesus as God, his absolute authority, his absolute power over everything. He controls it all. So there's a couple of things we should look at. The disciples here in fear naturally they're going to be afraid in the storm they wake jesus up verse 25 says the disciples went and woke him up saying lord save us we're going to drown now it's good to always go to jesus first mark also writes about this event mark adds in this detail that the disciples said to jesus lord don't you care don't you care that we're about to drown i mean drowning here help me now what, what's happening is in essence the disciples are saying this jesus if you cared about me i wouldn't be in this situation Now, let's be completely honest here. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever offered this kind of prayer or maybe a statement to somebody and said, God, if you really cared about me, see what's happening in my life right now, that wouldn't be happening, God. I wouldn't be struggling with this. And then they say this, and what does Jesus do? His first reaction is Jesus rebukes them. He gives them a little lesson. Jesus doesn't say, yeah, I get it. You know, this is kind of scary. Look at the water coming in the ship. We might sink any minute. Uh Uh-uh. Jesus looks at them and he says this. Oh, you of little faith. Why are you not trusting in me? I'm here with you. He says, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? What we're seeing is this truth. And this is a truth that we want to build up so firmly in our hearts by God's grace. That the current situation that you are in, whether it's good or it's bad, doesn't determine the love that God has for you or the power of God in your life. You don't sit in a situation where everything is going great and say, I must be loved by God. God is good because everything's good. Relationships, awesome. Money coming in, feel really healthy. God must love me. No way. On the other side, you don't look at your life and go, I'm really struggling here. I am hurting. I'm broken. God must not love me anymore. He must have given up on me. God is showing us that regardless of the situation you're in, his love, his power, his control never changes. Never changes. You find out about the faithfulness of God for you in his word. 
That's where you measure God. That's where you look to God. Not in your situation, but in his word. Disciples need to learn this. We need to learn this. Jesus loves us. He loves us even if he lets us go through a storm. Even if you're in a storm, Jesus is saying, I'm in control. I'm in control of your lives. Put your weight on me. Put your trust in me. He may let things happen to you, things you don't even understand. God does things that aren't according to your plan. He does things that don't even make sense to us at times. But what God is saying is, I'm God, and I care, and I love you. And if God is great enough to save us, to redeem us, to control all things, then there must be a thousand reasons to why whatever's happening is happening, even if I can't see it, even if I struggle with it. God's power is unbound, and so is his wisdom, and so is his love. And that's why we want to go back to that opening sentence. For every one thing that we see, God is doing thousands of things we don't see. So we go to the cross, where Jesus shows himself and his love for us. So we go to our Redeemer, who's taken our sins and brought us to be with him. His name we pray. Amen.